floor plates, and so those should be cover plates, but look what's on top of the cover plates. Cover plates. Okay. That's weird. Here's the camera on the side. So now we're looking at the ambulacrum side on. There's the floor plates there. There are the hood plates. And there are the cover plates. So there's another way to look at it is those are the floor plates on the inside, those are the floor plates on the outside, and those are the cover plates. Do you know who else has an arrangement just like that? Streptasker. Surprise! Here it is, here's a picture. Look at that. The red are the inner plates, the yellow are the outer plates, the hood plates, and the blue are the cover plates. So that's what it looks like. So all we've done in a pergo system is we've actually fused one of the two sets of floor plates together, we've retained the outer set, and we've kept the cover plates in the same sort of bizarre articulation we saw before. That, as a reminder, is the thing from China. Okay, so the arrangement's very similar. How about Idrioaster ids? Well, if you look at an Idrioaster id, I think what we're doing is we're actually doing something similar. Note the funny articulation I pointed before. The floor plates stick into the middle, they have those pores, but they also extend on the outside of the body wall, with the cover plates articulating in that notch. Ebrioaster is have lost the inner set of plates, and the articulation of these outer set of plates are exactly the same as the yellow plates up here. Okay? So all we've done in that group is lose the red plates. One group we fuse, one group we lose. I should write that down. <laughs> <laughs> now, in the rest of isoropids, we simply take that pattern we already saw in pergosystems, which are very closely akin to isoropids, and we simply take it one step further by completely losing the yellow plates the plates on the outside. So here, in an isorophid, again viewed from the inside in those nice rubber fossils, are the floor plates, the inner ones, the red ones, the yellow ones are missing, and these are the cover plates. Now there's something else that has become very, very obvious from these detailed investigations of internal morphology. And that is, Hebrew asteroids were thought not to have a funny thing called a podial basin. Podial basins are places where the two feet bulb, the thing that you squeeze like an aspirator to extend the tube foot, sits. I found them. Look, there they are. And in fact, if you look very closely, where the floor plates are stripped away, you see there's actually a canal that connects those little pits to the inside of the ambulacrum. Okay, so they do have full-fledged, perfectly normal echinoderm pores, something that Dolph Silacker attacked me for once, Carl. Were you there? God. <laughs> now look at this. Recognize this taxon? That's Isorophus, and what that is is it's a single ambulacrum scrap. And we're looking at it dead on from the side. There are the floor plates. These are the cover plates. And look what I found. Look at these. What are those? Same thing. Those little podial pores. And those pores go into the ambulacral tunnel. So Isoropus has podial bases. We've never recognized these before in these types of animals. Very cool. And you can see this specimen in parenthesis. <laughs> so that's what an isorophid looks like. All we've done is we started with this, we've lost the yellow plates, and because the cover plates aren't articulated to them anymore, they just flop onto the end like that, and we have these sort of seesaw ambulacra. Just like that. Well, is this a transitional fossil? 
They're all transitional. <laughs> so to put it into one of these phylogenetic perspectives that I'm so fond of, if you know me, here's the, a, a new idea of how the tree of egrio asteroids are, are done. And these are the major modifications we see. This is where we transition from very complicated cover plates to very simple cover plates. Over here, we lose the red plates on the inside. Over here, we fuse the red plates on the inside. And over here, we lose the yellow plates on the outside. And if you do that, then all of the Ebrio asteroid morphologies make sense. The problem is the way Bell, if you know Bell's big, thick Ebrio book, he had a lot of these things and these things all mixed together because of this, 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 I won't call it a lack of understanding, even though it is. Bell did a very good job, but Cincinnati doesn't lend itself to knowing what the inside looks like, and that's where most of the specimens came from. So basically, the, the, the bulk conclusion of all of this is the cover plates, I mean, the floor plates have evolved rather dramatically throughout Ebrio asteroids. We've just never been able to identify it before because internal morphologies are not evident. The biggest problem is if you have an Ebrio asteroid that's attached to a brachiopod shell, if you see the outside, you know what species it is. If you know what species it is, you can't see the inside because it's attached to a brachiopod. If you have a lucky specimen where it's flipped over, you can see all the internal information and you can't figure out what species it is because you can't see the top. Oh well, that's why moldic fossils are beautiful and why Bertrand was right. So what does that have to do with these? And starfish. The problem with starfish and the origin of starfish has always come down to the same thing. Everyone wants to start with an Ebrio asteroid and say, voila, I did a couple things, bingo, I've got a, a starfish out of it, right? Ebrio starfish connection goes way back in people's thinking. The problem has always been that Ebrio asteroid is, which people have been pointing to, have one set of floor plates. Right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, all the way up the ambulac. Starfish do not. Starfish have right, left, right, left, right, left plates all the way up up the ambulacrum, and another set of plates on the outside of that, alternating with them, called ad ambulacrums. In other words, they have a row of plates alternating up the middle, and a row of plates alternating up the sides. Sound familiar? Aha! So, oh, I already said that. So that's what a starfish looks like if you chop it in half. There's the ambulacral plates and the ad ambulacral plates. And just to remind you, if you don't know starfish, they live upside down. So the actual top of the animal is down. So this is flipped from the orientation we've been looking at. Now look at that. We have a set of plates on the inside alternating with pores and a set of plates on the outside alternating with pores. So, so where, what might be the connection we're looking for? Flip it over, strip the cover plates off, and look, everything aligns just right. Woo! Very cool. Now there's, a, there's one big problem with this model, and this is a mo I, I don't know that I can explain this very well, but I will try. If an, an organism is descended from another organism, the evidence for that is there should be no change between the two organisms except what's unique to the descendant organism. I'm not sure if you followed that, I'll try it again. <laughs> if I evolve into something else. The only thing that would be consistent with that is the thing that I evolved into might be different, but there's nothing I have in my morphology that is not also found in the descendant lineage. If I have some differences, that means I've evolved my own merry way as well. 